Hi, welcome to the Signal Pad. In this episode, I have another product repair for you guys, and something really amazing happened. There's a company called Altest Instruments Incorporated. You may already know about them. They have a huge range of inventory and instrumentation uh, on their website. They wrote me and said that they have watched a couple of my videos where I do repair of various instruments, and they really like them, and they wanted to know if there is any way they can contribute to my lab with anything that I might want to repair. So they asked me, is there something you want to fix on camera? We can send you one. We have a lot of broken equipment we haven't repaired yet, and maybe you can use one. So I thought, well, what kind of instrument should I be repairing? Well, I've always wanted to have an eight and a half digit multimeter in my lab. The best multimeter in terms of resolution that I have is this seven and a half digit Keithley DMM7510. So I said, do you have an Azure 3458A, which is like the industry standard eight and a half digit multimeter? He said, sure we do, we can send you one. So they sent me one and it is right over here. So we're going to try and repair this. And this is an awesome equipment that doesn't work, of course. It's, it's just really everybody who does eight and a half digit measurements, this is really where they go to. So I'm excited to take a look inside and see if we can fix it. Now, before we do that, I want to tell you a little bit about the Altest uh, website and what kind of instruments they have, what kind of services they have. So there's, let's go and quickly take a look at their site, see what they offer, and then we'll jump to the repair of this. And there's also a, a special discount that they offer right now, which I want you to take advantage of. So let's go. So there are a couple of ways you can access the Altest Instruments inventory. At their main website, altest.net, you can see all their equipment listed, search for them, see prices and inventory and so on. They have more than 20,000 instruments in stock at any given time, so you're surely going to be able to find what it is that you're looking for. They also have an eBay store, and in their eBay store, they have all their instruments listed, but they also have components listed, so you can purchase individual components. If you're doing some repair yourself, for instance, this would be very helpful. Aside from that, in their own laboratory, they do full testing, uh, calibration, refurbishing of any instrument, and these services often can be quite a bit cheaper than going to the vendor themselves. And because they have a fully NIST traceable laboratory, you're going to be able to get your equipment NIST calibrated and bring them to the OEM level uh, before you get it back from them, of course. And this is hugely helpful and often reduces the cost of getting these units calibrated, especially uh, if they're older units which no longer are supported by the vendor. So, and they all can also find their store on bonanza.com. They're listed there with tons of equipment, as well as testunlimited.com. All their instruments are listed there as well. They're also doing something else, which is pretty awesome. They are going to give a 5% discount to first-time customers if you mention my website, the signal pad to them, you get a 5% discount. Now, this discount is completely yours. I don't get any of that. This is just so that they know uh, how, many, how much people are watching my videos and how many of them, of course, are coming from my website and just so that they can give back to the community of the people who are uh, getting involved in these YouTube videos, which is amazing. So make sure you take advantage of that. I think it's a great offer that they're uh, providing for you guys. So having said that, let's go and take a look at the unit. Okay, here we have the unit. So I'm eager to get started on this. So as you can see, very classic look of this 3458A. If you buy this unit now, it's going to look exactly the same, except for the front panel is going to say Keysight. Now, the internal construction of this unit since it was introduced, I think in 1989, has changed significantly. A lot of the boards have changed. The digital section in particular has changed quite a lot. The processor has been modernized. The way the calibration is stored and the SRAM and the memory then on there, it's all, everything's basically changed. And this looks to be a very early unit. So I expect it to be in vintage 1989, 1988, or 1990, I'm not sure. I think this might be the first batch, basically. So let's go ahead and turn it on and see what happens. One of the things I'm worried about is how dim the display would be if it's a very old unit. So it's plugged in. Let's see. There we go. Oh, you know what? This screen's not bad. So ACAL, SCAL, oh, SCAL required is not good. CAL all required. Okay, it hasn't been turned on. Secure required. That's a little bit unusual. Um, now, normally when you see all those errors in a row, it could be indicative of a bad memory, but uh, I'm hearing it doing some bizarre clicking inside, and um, that doesn't seem to be doing anything else. So it, testing hardware seems to continue. Let me see. No, it's, it's failing something. Uh, it's weird that it's not giving me an error. I can hear it clicking, trying to do something inside, so maybe it's better to not run it anymore. So definitely there's something wrong with it, obviously, as we were expecting. So anyway, let's not keep uh, holding on anymore. Let's open it up and take a look inside. I'm very eager. This is a just a beautiful instrument from an analog point of view. So I'm eager to take a look at it. And here's a look inside the unit. This is from the top. And as you can see, it is absolutely beautiful. This is one of the early units. And the layout and the design of this thing is just a masterpiece, really. And uh, this the instrument is broken into several 
different boards and these boards are all optically isolated from each other and I'll talk about that a little bit and this top here is most likely the AC the DC board the AC board is on the other side and the digital board is down here we'll talk about that too so up here is our main reference precision resistors you can see they're 0 0.01 percent uh, most likely V-shaped components uh, this is the linear uh, diode reference there underneath this cap LTZ family most likely and being protected naturally um, by uh, thermally and so on with the cap that's around it so we won't touch that we won't disturb it you should never touch any of this with your hand uh, otherwise you'll have to completely clean it off again with uh, alcohol and so on if you do any work on it it'll have to be all cleaned up uh, any leakage any oil from your hand will to totally throw off such a precision instrument you can see some arrays of uh, resistors it looks like guarded by um, a layout uh, around it with the silk screen is missing it's just, just beautiful a lot of read uh, relay switches uh, all over the place over there so we won't really do much with it at this point just examining and see if there is anything obvious now this is an old old unit so the power supply capacitors might be might have gone bad the power supply voltages might be bad and it looks like i was right about the vintage if you look over here the firmware it says the 38th week of 1989 so i was only eight years old when this was programmed which is quite extraordinary now unfortunately this dallas uh, uh, zero volt memories uh, these are non volatile sram memories these these have built-in batteries and they only have a shelf life of about 10 to 15 years and these are clearly much older than that so these might have gone bad now this particular unit has not been populated with additional memory but it can easily be done so by replacing this now unfortunately keysight has not placed these on sockets the original ones that come with the unit do not have a replaceable socket so if you remove these which we will have to do because they're very old we'll have to put our own socket in place these you can still buy uh, from DigiKey, and uh, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to buy extra ones to fill this. Now, these are not cheap at about $20 each. So just to upgrade the memory back to normal, you'll be looking at, you know, $200 or so. Now, having said that, this particular one over here, this is 64K, I think. This one has all the calibration information in it. So if you lose that, your calibration information is gone. Now, this probably has not been calibrated, doesn't even have a calibration sticker on it. So I'm assuming this is still the original. And if this even works, I don't think the calibration is very valuable on this unit anyway. So we'll lose that. Now, these are used to store some other settings and so on. So it, I don't think this matters. So we will replace these, remove them, read them with a memory reader, some kind of a programmer, universal programmer, and just keep the data that's in it anyway, even though it may be corrupted. And we can find out. There's a Motorola 68000 series. Look at how enormous this package is. It's crazy, uh, which is the main brain of this instrument. Fan over here sounds still very good. I think the fan is, is still in good shape. I don't think this thing has seen many hours, to be honest. It's ridiculously clean on the inside, so I'm very happy about that. Does it, except for the fact that it doesn't work. It seems to be uh, doing quite nicely. The main transformer over here sitting in the front. And uh, if you look carefully, actually, I don't see any on this side. I don't see any fiber optics running between the boards, but there is a fiber optic running between the two boards, and I believe that's going to be on the other side. This is interesting. Uh, it doesn't see it's some kind of a zip tie. It doesn't seem to have uh, been tied down. That's unusual. So yeah, uh, nothing other than that to talk about. There's this power supply module over here, which I'm not exactly sure. M might be something just feeding some other. Oh, actually, never mind. I, I can see that. So the transformer directly goes there. So it must be one of the main power supplies. So having said that, I think it would be nice to take a look at the other side. This. Um, unit over here lots of protection circuitry this side mounted pcb that you see is the selection of the front and rear terminals which one is being used and it has its own protection circuitry on it it has spark gaps uh, well, lots of different kind of components just on a little board just to make sure that you switch back and forth. The, obviously, the resistance, the repeatability of all those components are critical. So all of this is beautiful. So let's go ahead, flip it to the other side and take a look. Uh, just a few other things. Sorry, I keep finding new things that I want to talk about. These are individually, these boards are all isolated from each other. And it's very neat to take a look and see how everything is mounted. So there's plastic pieces here that basically float individual boards so these boards are electrically floating with respect to each other except for the connection is intended to be made so the chassis isn't necessarily connected everywhere which is quite nice as you need it for such an instrument so let's flip it over take a look and see what we can do on the other side and here is the other side which is of course just as beautiful this is our main power supply of the unit the ac line enters here 
the voltage selection unit as uh, switches are here and you've got to be very careful with this because if you have the wrong selection here you can actually destroy this board these capacitors definitely need to be replaced main power switch is over there so this is definitely the main power supply section you can see connections from here to the front panel i believe as well as to the other side of the digital board so there is electrical connections between the main power supply and the, the display and the digital board and that's okay because you don't care so much about noise in that case that's not the sensitive analog part those are digital components they have tons of noise digital switching noise anyway and then on this side we have the main ac board this AC board, I'm going to zoom into it in just a second. So if you look carefully, you'll notice that whenever there is a ribbon cable connection, it goes to either an analog section where it does need to be electrically connected or goes to another digital section. Otherwise, the boards are not connected. And let me zoom in or pan over here. So here's the main hybrid ADC board, I believe. I have to double check, but this is a lot of custom components on here. I'm not going to take these off until we need to the AC board over here and the way it measures the AC it actually converts to DC first before making that measurement it makes sense it's an RMS instrument and this thing that you see here is looks appears to be a Teflon coax and I think they're using that as a capacitor for the sampling of some voltage conversion I mean the things you do when you don't care about cost now a Teflon coax cable as a capacitor would make an ultra high quality capacitor extremely low leakage and that's why they're using it there because it's critical for uh, sample and hold circuitry now the boards here are isolated from the power supply and digital boards by, by these fibers these are fiber optics there's an rx tx a laser and photo detector module here and there's a laser and photo detector module here and that's how these boards talk to each other so there's two two over here and two over here uh with just outside of the screen over there there you go so these two txrx modules talk to these txrx modules and vice versa i believe these are txrx modules let me see yep you can see the gray one goes to the blue one and the blue one goes to the gray one so definitely they are reversed so yes yeah, so if these guys for example die the, the detector or the laser uh, the led dies in there then of course uh, you would be not uh, passing any soft test so they or, or passing some maybe making some connection mistakes or some uh, computational error if they are intermittent so it's very interesting to take a look and see how these things are connected there's so much to learn you could spend hours just looking at how the engineers thought about putting this thing together it's just so beautiful i love this kind of instruments so i don't see anything wrong with this is exceptionally clean the capacitors look kind of okay so i think one of the very first things to do is just simply measure the voltages of the power supply it's always a good place to start and see if the power supplies are in the right places well i was just looking around and wait a second i see something I see something and I can't be that simple there's no way but do you notice something and <laughs> check it out it doesn't look like that this cable is fully and uh, this fiber is fully inserted as you can see they're quite different from each other I wonder if this has come out uh, over time due to thermal stress or mechanical shock let me see there we go that makes more sense that's how it should be let me just double check all the other ones now we're here Yep, these ones are okay on this side. Let me zoom back out so you can see what I'm talking about. The ones over here. Yep, these guys are good. And the ones down here, they're also good. Well, there's no way that this is the problem. Well, this would explain it not passing the hardware self-test because if it can't communicate, it would get stuck uh, at some point be trying to figure out what the situation is. Well, now I want to plug it back in again. You know what, let's just plug it back in and see if it, there's any difference. Uh, sometimes these things don't, don't need to be fully inserted anyway because they will work over very short distances. This is not a very high dynamic range optical link anyway. So let's go ahead and give it a try. <laughs> I'm very eager to see what happens. All right, let's go ahead and turn it on. It's upside down, of course, but that's okay. Here we go. Oh, you know what, it would help if I actually turn on my isolation transformer and plug it in. Without it, obviously, it's not going to work. So here we go, plug it in. And let's try again there it is okay so it still says the same thing Pascal yep is this still, is this still going to say security raise yep it is secure or secure required testing harbor oh it made a loud clicking noise and oh unbelievable it actually came online so yeah so that fiber connection was critical and obviously because it was it couldn't communicate so it was stuck in that mode there that's it that's just a ridiculous problem that doesn't really count as a repair of course but um, although the voltage is rising so i'm not sure if it's working and those errors at the beginning that the a cal is normal it just means it needs to have automatic calibration it probably hasn't been done on it for a long time s cal is not good because you need a special equipment for that 
and the secure uh, required stuff I'm not uh, quite sure. Now sometimes those errors are actually generated because of the memory problems. Now there's two things I want to do with this. First of all, change the memory chips, copy the calibration coefficients over onto a brand new one so that it works correctly, and also update the firmware. Now this thing has UV erasable uh, chips in it, and we can erase those and put the latest firmware on it. Now this was not up this since 1989. So having the latest firmware, which is many, many versions ahead, uh, is going to be fantastic. So I'm going to put some effort doing all of that. And then we can also check the power supply voltages just to make sure that we're okay. And at the end, if everything goes well, we'll change the caps. So I think that's worthwhile. Let's go ahead, uh, flip it out, take the board out, and start working on getting those components updated. Okay, so that's going to be pretty straightforward now that it's out of here. So I've got to remove these two components and actually these three components, put some sockets in their place. I've already ordered and received the components and then take these guys out, remove these labels and erase them in the UV eraser and upload the correct firmware to each of them. Now these are all identical parts, but this uh, U110, U12, U114, these are designation of the portion of the firmware. Then you're uh, boards that are recent, basically, they will have it all on one chip. Nobody uses UV erasable memories anymore. That's why we have flash. So we're going to go ahead and do that. It's going to take a while to get all these things out. But I'll show you a couple of the things along the way. All right, a couple of steps completed here. I have populated these memory with brand new ones, and I've upgraded the memory to the uh, larger amount, which is option 01, I believe. Uh, here is the firmware chips that are missing. I put them here in the UV eraser, so I'm going to turn it on and start erasing those. I only have four empty spots on this, so I'm going to have to do it in a couple of steps. And this last memory here, which cal calibration storage, I haven't uh, populated yet, but as you can see, everything is now socketed nicely. And I'm going to copy the data from the old one onto this, although I don't really think that really matters that much because that data is not valid anyway. But it's going to be quite nice and see what happens with the firmware upgrade, and then we can begin to really debug it and see if there is any remaining issue on the device. Most likely there is still something else wrong, but this is probably the first step that needs to be completed. Okay, with the new firmware in, we can go ahead and power it on and see uh, what kind of errors we get once we run it through a self-test or a calibration cycle. So let's see what happens. Here we go. There it is. I'm sorry, it's upside down now, of course. So no, it still says those things, so it definitely does need that SCAL and it still says secure required. So those all have to do with calibration. So now it's doing some testing. No, it did generate an error. And uh, let's see what that error is. So okay, so the error is referring to calibration. Okay, so we know that. So we just clear out the errors, and let's do a self-test on it. So the self-test is uh, quite elaborate on these units. It goes through a wide range of checks, checks voltages, resistance, AC, DC, and, a kind, and um, across a different set of ranges that are available. So this is uh, quite important. Now, even if it passes all the self-tests, it doesn't mean it doesn't have long-term problems and drifts and so on, but and at least this will give us a good indication. Now, I don't know how long this takes, but it could be a while because it has to go through all the steps. So I'm going to let it run and let's see what happens. Okay, so the self-test fails, so there's definitely something wrong. So let's go ahead and see what that error is now. And the error is 204, hardware failure, I'm assuming, yep. And it is a flatness DAC conversions. 198. So it actually generates more than one type of error. So sometimes it says this and sometimes it says test value out of range and it gives us a number and that number indicates that the problem is on the A2 assembly which is the AC assembly. Now this DAC convergence is also on the A2 assembly so whatever the problem is is definitely confined to that board. So we can go ahead and take a look at that particular board and, and see what we find and if it is uh, repairable in some way. So there's a lot of tests you can do. This is a fairly complicated circuit of course but we can chase that around and see what we can find. So we at least have a place to look at, given that both of the errors it generates uh, are always pointing out to the same thing. So that's a good thing to take a look at first. Let's go and look at that board. And here's the A2 assembly, and this is responsible for some of the AC functions. I spoke a little bit about it earlier with regards to this low leakage Teflon uh, capacitor here. Now, I looked at it with the thermal camera, and I did notice that a few components get hotter than the rest. Now they're not too hot, but they're a little bit hotter than everything else on the board. Now one of them is this voltage regulator underneath this uh, fiber. The other one is this voltage follower, buffer, and this one I believe was a comparator. So what I did is I took the board out and I socketed these two components. Now I didn't replace them with new ones because I don't have a replacement right now, but I did socket them so we can remove them in case we need to remove them. And I also noticed this board had seen some work in the past. These fuses were replaced 
down here there was some solar flux left over around that area and this component that I socketed was actually originally replaced because on the other side I could tell that someone had changed it and that uh, they hadn't uh, cleaned it up and th the solder looked quite different than everything else. So I wonder what had happened in the past. Maybe it was either serviced by Keysight or somebody else. Or th what I'm really worried about that it was something diagnosed and just couldn't be repaired and they just put it back together and it was never kind of uh, fixed, which would kind of explain the, the fact that this uh, fiber wasn't completely plugged in. Maybe that's what it was. It's like a repair attempt that was never really completed. So either way, we're going to give it a try and go around and take a look and see what's going on. So obviously measuring the voltages would be the first logical thing. And then after that, we can see if those voltages make sense. We do have the schematic, which is a huge help, and that will help us uh, figure out at least uh, where to look and look at the various signals as the unit operates. So let's go and see what we can do. So I went ahead and I also removed the shield. Now normally I wouldn't remove it because I don't want to get any dirt on it and I don't want to accidentally touch anything here but uh, it was causing too much reflection in the camera. So you can see how various wiring is done on Teflon standoffs. It's because they don't want to even rely on the isolation of the PCB material itself. The leakage is so critical on this sensitive wiring here that they have chosen to do an air wiring over these Teflon standoffs as opposed to using the PCB. You can see some more protection spark gaps around here. So just be careful and not touch any of these things and just do some basic measurements. So I have my multimeter here. Now I know that there is a 15 volt and minus 15 volt uh, power supply. And we already measured, uh, or I, I don't remember if I recorded that or not, but I will measure it again, the plus and minus power supply. So let's go ahead and give that a try. I'm going to turn this on. And let's uh, do some measurements on this power supply. So we do have plus and minus 18 and plus 5 volts. Now these plus and minus 18s aren't exactly accurate. They should be within 1 or 2 volts. We can go ahead and measure that. Again, as always, you have to do these things extremely carefully, not because you're worried about damaging the equipment, but because, of course, you're worried about getting zapped yourself. So let's go ahead and measure. So first thing we expect is plus 18. And what do we read? 18.4. That's a healthy voltage right there. Minus 18. Minus 18.6, that's also good in the plus 5 for the digital circuitry, which is exactly 5 volts. So I'm not worried about that. Those appear to be working uh, quite nicely. Now let's go ahead and try the plus and minus 15 volt power supply. So now let's see what's the best place for me to place this um, probe here. So this is a reference uh, analog ground in the middle. So let's measure... Let me see, is this minus 15? There it is, minus 15 volts. So this is a regulated supply at minus 15 which is okay, and the plus 15 should be this one, 14.7. Hmm, now that seems a little bit low. I'm not sure why it is low. Now there's a few things that could cause that. The voltage regulator could be pulled down because something is dragging it down because it's drawing too much current from it, or the regulator could be somewhat defective. So what do we do is, well, one option, a simple option is to remove the regulator, test it outside of the circuit to see if it provides a good solid 15 volt reference or not. And then I also tried removing these components which were getting warmer and then powering it on and measuring the voltage from the regulator and it made no difference. It was still uh, the same 14.6 volt which means that those two components which are warmer than everything else are not, at least I don't think, are responsible for pulling that voltage down. So let's see what we can do next. I think I might take that regulator out just to measure it, just to make sure that there's nothing wrong with it. So I took both of the regulators out and I replaced them. So it turns out that one of them was actually reading quite low. So it, I think it might be simply due to aging. And these things are so old that uh, the output has drifted away. This can sometimes happen on semiconductor material because there's a reference voltage inside the regulator and that reference voltage is drifting. The resistors that set that voltage may be drifting and so on. So I changed them. I changed them both to a plus and minus a matched regulator. Now, as you can see, these are much higher power handling regulators. Now you may think that that's a really good thing, but in reality, I wouldn't rec necessarily recommend this for an instrument like this. Generally speaking, the noise of a voltage regulator scales with how much current it can provide. That has to do with the biasing and the amount of current that internally is required to set the reference and drive the output transistor and have the op amps that are in there and so on. And generally, they tend to be more noisy when they can provide more current. So putting larger than required regulators here is not necessarily good for a precision instrument that's very low noise. But for now, we're going to live with that. So how do we go from here? So I measured this, now they're correct, plus and minus 15 volts exactly like they're supposed to be. So there's nothing that's actually dragging these voltages down. The temperature is nice and healthy. So if you want to really now debug this, given that we know what kind of error we're getting, this DAC convergence error, let's go to the schematic and trace around exactly what the signal path, no pun intended, is uh, looking like. And then from that, we can 
look for some critical points where this error could actually be coming up. So now we have to jump on the computer and take a close look at the schematic. And here's the schematic of the A2AC assembly. As you can see, it's fairly complicated. This is one page of many of the different schematics for the different cars that are present in this unit. We're going to only focus on this one. We're not going to go through everything else, otherwise that would take forever. So let's go ahead and look at the very first thing that I did. So the first thing I did was to replace the voltage regulators. So let's go all the way up here and locate those voltage regulators and here they are. You can see there's two of them. One of them over here, this is a plus 15 volt regulator and this is the minus 15 volt regulator being fed from plus and minus 18 volts. And we saw that the outputs are now stable, everything's working and there's a couple of other voltages that are derived from the other power supply sections and they're all functional, appropriate filtering and everything is on there. So now where do we start? Well, this is nicely divided into various functions. So there's the low voltage attenuator, high voltage attenuator, which is the input section of this entire instrument. And this, is, this allows you to apply different levels of attenuation to the signal coming in. Remember the signal going to the instrument can be as large as a thousand volts. So it has to be able to attenuate that signal to bring it within the range of the data conversion. And this is done by selecting different levels of attenuation through these two circuitry. So the low voltage attenuation clearly deals with smaller signals and the high voltage attenuation will deal with larger signals. So let's zoom in here, because I'm sure it's very difficult to see otherwise. So the low voltage attenuation you would expect to have uh, the gains of one and below, below one. So indeed you can see there's a gain one here, so the signal going in it can experience a gain of one. There's also a gain of point one, and you can see they all add up to the same point over here, and there's a guard around that point where these voltages actually join up to each other. Remember the signal is still AC, and it hasn't been converted to an RMS value yet. So let's go over here and look at the high voltage attenuation and as you would expect the high, volta high voltage attenuation is going to have the higher attenuation region. So here's a gain of 0.1, it joins back up, here's a gain of 0.01 and a gain of 0.0001. So it can attenuate quite a bit, it has to, in order to be able to bring the signal within the range of the amplifier which follows. Now after that, we're going to have our main amplifier which is right over here. And you can see the main amplifier is fed from the same point coming from after all the attenuations. Here's the main amplifier section and I hope that this is not dead because this I would not be able to find a replacement very easily. So quite nicely differential pair with active loads at the top. Uh, quite a, a simple architecture really. And then it goes, the output of that goes through this final amplification stage and then moves forward. Now after that we would expect to begin seeing circuitry which is responsible for two things. First of all overload detection, so auto ranging can happen and triggering can happen and also the signal required to convert to RMS values so that the A to D converter can do final computation and give you the real true RMS value of the signal coming into the instrument. And all of that is handled next. Now one nice thing here is that we do in fact have a test point of the output of the amplifier. So we can look at the output of the amplifier before it goes through any of that. And this will verify that by changing the range of the amplifier, by, by changing the range on the instrument, so different ranges of the AC measurement, we should be able to see different amplitude of signal coming out here. Now normally in an auto ranging instrument, this is done automatically, but we can manually change it and we will be able to see this amplitude grow and even saturate if you're in the wrong uh, range there. So then the signal after that, experiences a few different paths. The first one, it goes to overload detection circuitry, which is all of this circuitry over here, overload detection, triggering, all of that. We're not gonna bother with that. That's not where our problem is. And then there is two other circuits down here. First the one is a track and hold. So the signal goes through a track and hold, and that's the part of the capacitor that I mentioned to you. The track and hold signal comes from the A to D converter itself, and all of that signal is then fed to the high speed A to D converter. And then at the bottom here, we have the RMS converter, and the RMS converter can also receive the signal, convert it to RMS, have different ranges and so on, different frequency settings will have different settings here because the RMS value and constants would have to change. I'm not going to bother with all of that because the problem is still not in this section. This is another component that hopefully is not dead because I don't think you're going to be able to find a replacement for that very easily neither. So let's go and see where is this flatness stack then? Well, the flatness stack is fed all the way over here from the attenuators. And that would make sense. The purpose of this flatness compensation is to compensate for the attenuation flatness. So if I take a look closely, you can see that there is some signal that comes from this portion of the high gain attenuation. Now we don't see exactly where it comes from, unfortunately, because it's a little bit that hasn't been scanned correctly. But the signal from that goes in here and goes into the reference input 
of a DAC. The DAC input is fed with these registered digital bits to set the value of the DAC, and the output of that is then taken out through another uh, op amp there to a signal which then goes all the way back to somewhere around here to set the flatness of the attenuator. So that you can see how this loop closes back onto itself and all these signals are interdependent. Here's some uh, relays in the front for range switching so now you know where that sound comes from when the signal is too large and you hear a clicking sound that's the relay switching into the high voltage attenuation section. Interesting thing to note, a spark gap here set to 90 volts in case the range is in the wrong place, the spark gap will, will absorb. Uh, this is a destructive overload section obviously because the spark gap will close that circuit down. So anyway, so if there is a DAC problem, it is reasonable to assume that it is somewhere in this attenuation flatness compensation circuitry. So the signal coming from this portion going through U401 will have to reach the reference of this DAC and the output of the DAC will have to change as the registers change. If that doesn't happen or if any of these three components are dead or not working, then you would not have the flatness DAC pass the test. So this is a very good place to look. But just to make sure for sanity purposes, we can actually go ahead and take a look at the signal coming directly out of our main amplifier after all the attenuations and switches and all. And I just want to make sure that by changing the range on the instrument manually, that I can actually get the signal to change in amplitude. So how do we do that? Well, I can actually apply an AC signal directly to the instrument. And I'm going to use my virtual bench here because it has a built-in uh, function generator. So we're going to use that, apply a signal to the input of the instrument itself, and then set it to a certain voltage. Here I have it at one volt peak to peak. Uh, going in there, and then we can trace it out uh, as we go through the instrument. So it should be pretty interesting to try this out now. All right, let's get started here. So I'm going to have these two side by side. I'm going to show you where I'm probing, and hopefully this will become clear as we go along. So first thing is, let's go ahead and enable the function generator there. So I should be generating one volt peak to peak with zero volt offset at one kilohertz. Let's go ahead and measure that just to make sure this is coming out of the instrument. So I'm measuring the output of the waveform directly. There it is. You can see measurements at the bottom of the screen there. One volt, 350 millivolt RMS, and the frequency should be one kilohertz, which is interesting because in this instrument doesn't seem to be measuring it. It's weird that it doesn't show up here. I don't know why it doesn't measure the frequency. But anyway, so it is there. So everything is working correctly. So now let's go ahead and look at the output of the amplifier directly. So what I have done with the instrument itself is I have set the range to the highest range possible. So the highest range is um, you know, being able to measure 700 or 1000 volt signal. So we don't expect anything to come out of the uh, amplifier itself. Now amplifier is test point 401. So let's go ahead and look at that. And as you can see, we don't see anything coming out because the attenuation is huge, so naturally we don't see anything. So I'm going to go ahead and change the attenuation on the instrument. Let's go down by one level. So you can see we're beginning to see something come out. One more time. There it is. Now we're seeing some signals. So let me go ahead and change that uh, to AC coupling so that we only look at the AC portion of the signal. So now I'm going to go down again. There it is. So you can see it's becoming bigger and bigger. Now if I go one more time, it's going to be huge and eventually we're going to see that the signal now it's very large it's now about 20 volts peak to peak and if I do one more time now we're saturating so we're now seriously overloading the input and so the instrument can process that the amplifier remember we're looking at this point right here this amplifier is now fully saturating this op amp so I'm going to go back down so you can see it is working quite nicely, which means that the range switches do indeed change the attenuation. The signal path is working, the amplifier is working, this op amp is working, everything sounds good. So now let's go ahead and look at some other signals. Well, we can go ahead and look at the signal coming out of this op amp. We can look at the signal in this op amp. We can look at the output of the DAC. Now, this DAC doesn't really do anything during normal operation because it, you know, it has to go through the uh, either ACAL or self-test and then it's, once it's set, I don't believe it does anything unless the range changes. So we, let's start with something that would have an analog behavior. So let's go ahead and remove this. Uh, actually, let me put it back uh, one second. Let me change the range again. So the signal is tiny now. So the range is uh, on some of the higher voltage settings. And I'm gonna go ahead and look at pin number five of this op amp. So pin number five, is a signal coming from uh, one of these uh, attenuation sections. So pin number five should be right there. So here's a signal 
at 0.5 there. So if I change the signal going into the instrument, I change it to 10 volts, and you can see eventually this will become sinusoidal and then it will uh, become quite small. So let's go back to 10 volts. So this, this is a signal that the instrument would eventually use in order to do the, that compensation. So this is on a 100 millivolt per division. So I would expect that signal to be followed by the op amp U401 directly because it, this op amp is nothing more than a buffer is in unity feedback which then drives the reference of this DAC which changes the gain from 0 to 1. So let's look at the output which is either pin 6 or pin 7. Now remember this value, it's 148 millivolt peak to peak. I'm going to go to the next pin and check it out. Now it is 60 millivolt peak to peak. So it's not the right amplitude anymore. So now there's two ways it can happen. Either up amp U401 is defective and it's not performing the, uh, the following correctly. Uh, perhaps the output drivers are dead or the input is dead or something is wrong with it. Or the DAC over here is seriously clamping down and loading the output of the op amp, preventing it from being able to change. Either way, this op amp is not doing voltage following, which is what it's supposed to. So this is a very good place actually to look because if this is not working, then this whole chain won't work and then everything will be out the door. I can even go ahead and look at uh, the reference pin directly on the DAC itself. And if I go ahead and look at the reference directly on the DAC, that's pin number one. And you can see I see exactly the same signal. And pin number 17 is the output of the DAC. And uh, we'll have to figure out which pin that is because it says a lot of pins here. So let me go ahead and find that. So we have pin one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that would make it this one. There it is. So you can see it is indeed doing this, which makes sense. If the DAC doesn't have digital activity at its input and you change the reference to the DAC, the output of the DAC would follow. So this is this means that the DAC might actually be okay because it is doing what it's supposed to following the reference. So maybe the reference is actually fine on this DAC and the problem is with our U401B. So it is worthwhile taking a look and see where this U401 is. Now this U401, uh, because there's a B letter, it means there is another copy of it somewhere else being used for some other purpose. Uh, it's a, it's a, it must be a dual uh, component. So let's look for U401. Uh, here it is, it's right in front of me. So there it is, you can see uh, U401A is also used as a follower, which then drives the guard. So okay, that, uh, that all comes together. So these two circuits are actually working together. So what is that U401 anyway? Well, it's an LT1057. So let's dig out this data sheet and find out what it does. And here it is, here's LT1057, let get rid of this. So it is a dual and quad JFET input precision high speed op amp. So it's a generic JFET input uh, type of op amp, about five megahertz gain bandwidth product, uh, not, nothing out of the ordinary. And it's supposed to be probably fairly low uh, offset and trimmed and so on. But I see the main specifications here. Now this, this part is uh, very difficult to find. I just looked around my bin and I do have something that might uh, be okay. So this is a dual uh, JFET input. Well, I have this one. I have a, uh, a wide band with dual JFET input op amp, which is exactly what we want. Now we need to make sure the specification is at least somewhat similar. So the gain of four megahertz, that one has a gain of five megahertz. 13 volt per microsecond slew rate uh, is similar. For our purposes, I would say it's okay. We can use this just for now to see if the instrument comes back and it passes the self-test or not. I also looked at the uh, data sheet for our DAC. This is an uh, LC squared MOS 12-bit voltage DAC. Again, you would never find this as with the giant obsolete sign here indicates. It can be used in a few different configurations. There's an R2R architecture built into it. I did do it. I believe I did a full tutorial on, on data converters at some point and this was in there somewhere. So anyways, we're not going to go into the details of this. I'm very curious to see if I were to replace this, uh, whether this would work or not. I did go ahead and preemptively put both the DAC and this on uh, just comp on a socket so we can remove them and replace them and experiment with them. If something goes wrong, we can try different uh, op amps there. So there, everything is on a socket. So let's go ahead and take a look and see what that looks like. And here's that little component that I was talking about. So I placed uh, these three guys also on sockets because I was experimenting with them. But we can go ahead and remove the, the suspect component here. There it is. Let's get rid of that one. And let's put a replacement part in its place, the one that I just showed you. And that's a nice, simple fit. So now we can go ahead and power it on, run the same thing again, the self-test again. And I'm very curious to see what would happen. 
Okay, one more time, running through the test. So I'm just showing you right where it was failing before. That's where it was failing before. So let's see. Oh, that's promising. That is very promising. Check that out. So, and it's not testing the AC DC voltage range. It never got to this point before. So indeed it's different than uh, than before. So it's not testing the combined AC DC measurement capability. 10 volt range, 100 volt range. And come on, and the final kilovolt. And uh, oh, now it's changing the checking the down small ranges. It looks very good. The current and passed. Check it out. There it is. So it works. Uh, at least I should say the self test part works. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that it is 100% functional, but it at least means that we should be able to run the ACAL on it and see if after ACAL uh, it will perform correctly. So this is very promising. So let's go ahead and run the ACAL and ACAL and enter. So this is going to take some time. So I'm going to let it run, do its automatic uh, internal calibration. Unfortunately, the SCAL is still going to be required, but let's see what happens at the end of this. Now, if it pass passes the ACAL also, then it's uh, quite promising. Well, the ACAL also finished and didn't generate any errors, which is a good sign. Sorry that everything is still upside down. Let's plug something in there and uh, measure some, some signals. So I'm just going to connect that. And I'm going to see this is supposed to be 10 volts. And 3.5 volt RMS. Yep, that sounds about right. That's exactly what it should be. So it is measuring something correctly. It's just that it needs to go through full calibration. So it's not really uh, clear to me how I would do that at the moment. Let's go ahead and change this uh, to 1 volt. So now I would expect it to be the same. Yep, 353 millivolts. So it is indeed making measurements, which is excellent. Let's put some DC in there now. So let's put, um, let's say, I don't know, something like 5 volts maybe. So this is 5 volt uh, DC. So 5 volt DC obviously has no AC component. And remember, this is coming from my ARB. It's not perfectly clean. So it has definitely some AC, some ripple on it still. But let's go ahead and see if it measures the DC correctly. And DC, it should be 5 volts, and indeed it is 5 volts. So yeah, it is it is doing something, so that's all quite nice. And here's 10 volts. Yep, it is working quite nicely. Let me short the out input and see what we read when I short it. And here's a short. What are we reading? Yep, very, very close to zero. Again, this is not warmed up. Everything's open. The shields are not in there. So we, this requires some clear investigation to make sure. And I haven't set the number of line cycles to integrate. And all of that is still in the air. But we can do some uh, re resistance measurements. So this should be about zero, about half an ohm. That makes sense. And if I remove it, it should go to the maximum value. Overload in giga ohm. Yeah, so at least initially, it looks like it is doing the things it's supposed to do, which is uh, quite nice. So now the next step is, well, this whole board here requires a good bath because I touched it all over the place. There's solder, um, flux all over it. So that needs to be cleaned up. So let's go and clean it thoroughly, and then we'll figure out what to do. So not before we do any kind of calibration or even consider that we should thoroughly clean this board that has been handled so much during all these um, experimentation and changing the components is full of flux. And of course, I've been handling it with my hands there. So now I have uh, gloves on and I'm going to use high purity 99% isopropyl alcohol to soak the board in and slowly work at it with a toothbrush. That toothbrush is obviously nice because it gets all the nooks and crannies and it's an electric toothbrush. Don't worry about the toothbrush. It's not mine. It's my girlfriend's. So all is well. So let's go ahead and try that. So I'm going to just uh, put some alcohol all over the board here and uh, slowly go at it. And it will take some time. I'm not going to record all that. That will be really boring. But the idea is to make sure that at least part of the board that you're brushing is uh, well submerged. And even though this is a brand new alcohol container, I will still be able to find use for the alcohol afterwards. Maybe not for cleaning another sensitive board, but for use around the lab. So let's go ahead and do some cleaning and uh, we'll put it to dry. Well, this keeps getting better and better. The team at Altest Instruments Incorporated found out that I repaired this and they said that, you know what, we can help you with the calibration and they split the cost of the calibration with me. These guys are really awesome, which means that now we have a fully calibrated eight and a half digit multimeter here in the lab. This is fully functional, so the repair was successful and everything seems to be working nicely. So here I have my five volt multimeter reference here connected to three instruments at the same time. I have it connected to the Azure 34401A 
which is a six and a half digit multimeter. Here it is connected to the Kitley DMM7510, which is a seven and a half digit multimeter. And of course, connected to the Keysight or the Azure N3458A, eight and a half digit multimeter. So we're measuring this five volt reference with three instruments at the same time. Now you have to keep in mind that this unit here hasn't been calibrated in more than 10 years. The Kitley DMM hasn't been calibrated for a couple of years. So that's already kind of due for calibration as it is. And this has been just recently calibrated. There's one other thing to take into account. It's that the 10 meg input of this instrument, the Azure one, is on par in parallel with the 10 meg of this instrument. So one of the cables coming from the reference sees a lower impedance on one side than on the other side. So there is a little bit of an extra loading on this uh, it's 5 meg instead of 10 meg. Now having said that, over here we can see 5.0000. So naturally any differences between, any differences smaller than that would be invisible to the 6.5 digit meter. The Kitley DMM reads about 5.0000475. It jumps up and down as I bring my hand close to it. These are not very good cables. This is not a metrology level measurement here. It's just for demonstration. You can already see that just when I was explaining this, we have a dip here in our graph. So we are reading 5.000050, let's say. And you can see why the four zeros over here obviously match the four zeros here. Now the uh, key side one at the bottom here reads 5.000012. So there's a significant difference between these instruments, about almost uh, 30 or 40 counts between the 8.5 digit meter and the 7.5 digit meter. Now this could again be because of the calibration, there's some differences in the loading of the cables. But having said that, I think this is fairly interesting. Now I'm going to go around the lab and try and compare some of these multimeters and I'll maybe report some of that result later, but I'm very happy to have this. So what else can we do with this? Well, I have one special plan uh, to use this for. Let me tell you about it. And well, check this out. This is an Azure 3245A, a universal source for both DC and AC. And the nice thing about this is that this particular unit is equipped with the option which includes a times 10 multiplier, which means this can generate up to hundreds of volts with the necessary accuracy and stability that you would expect from this type of instrument. Now, I'm going to upgrade this and replace the reference with an even higher precision stability reference, and then we're going to calibrate that uh, using the brand new 8.5 digit meter that we have. So that together they will have a metrology grade source and measure instrument together, which would be awesome. Now the repair, calibration, all of that is going to be in a different video, but it is thanks to this instrument that I can now get this one up and running and be able to uh, get them to work together, of course. And then we can test, use these instruments as references for many other things, which will be pretty awesome. And I think Pooch also agrees. Isn't that right, Pooch? That's his favorite spot right there. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed the repair of this eight and a half digit multimeter. This is an awesome unit here to have in the lab. Now I can work on the other instrument as I showed you that I can create a metrology grade reference and these two units together, you can then test many other instruments and use them as references and as transfers and so on. So it's fantastic to have this. These are uh, not cheap. Even when they're completely broken, they're not cheap. So I, I'm really grateful to Altest um, Instrument for sending this and really, really giving back to the community, enabling these videos and future videos. So make sure you go on their website, let them know that you, you saw this and, and that you're very happy from this donation and take advantage of the 5% discount. It's going to add up and it's going to be quite beneficial. So I hope you like this. I'll see you in the comment section.